A PID controller for servo motor is shown here that is a circuit implemented using or with two op amps, uh, two capacitors and bunch of resistors. A VREF or set point voltage at the input is set that is setting a desired speed for the servo motor. Then at the output of the PID a voltage is generated V2 that is then driving uh, so it's fed to the input of power amplifier that is able to generate large enough current to drive pulse width modulator then then generates the pulses that at, at this node that controls the speed or adjusts the speed of the servo motor in such a way that the tachometer or RPM meter at the output of servo motor when it measures the speed and report back a, back a voltage VRPM that is proportional to a speed the ideal scenario is this VRPM should be equal to VREF in reality it is not because of many error sources and uh, <coughs> mechanical delay and inertia that cause a delta so there is always a gap or delta whatever is small between this VRPM and VREF and similar to the operation of a PLL circuit uh, there is an error term that is generated at the output of this difference calculator op amp and this V1 which is a voltage at the output of op amp as a function of time is going to be proportional to the error term that is the delta between VREF and VRPM and then this is fed uh, as the input to the PID portion of the circuit that is computing V2 which is then a voltage with three components these three components are the ones that I'm highlighting here so it has uh, a component that is I'm gonna write it here so V2 of T is equal to this thing and there is a component in it that is just proportional to the error that is as at its input. There is a second component that is proportional to integral of input which is integral of error and there is a third component that is proportional to derivative of input which is the derivative of error. The reason that we are implementing it this way is because error is a signal as a function of time it has a frequency response it has frequency components so if I show the response body plot magnitude frequency response of the output of PID so basically 20 log 10 V2 Omega we are trying to deal with all sorts uh, sources of noise in all frequencies so for the error term manage the error and minimize the error via the feedback loop so for example in one implementation of this PID by proper selection of components uh, these components uh, we can achieve a response that looks like this roughly very rudimentary fashion showing it so basically what I'm trying to say is uh, at uh, super low frequencies near DC the best we can do to keep the loop closed and not open is just uh, mainly or dominantly proportion and then between uh, in in the range of uh, some low range frequencies up to F1 then we are able to uh, dominantly have an integrator which is trying to integrate low uh, frequency noises so that overall we integrate and report back uh, a voltage that can adjust those low frequency noise components and then in some mid-range frequencies between F1 and F2 we get mostly a proportional component out of PID and then in some uh, large enough frequencies we get mostly the derivative component and the reason for that is magnifying high frequency component because when you take a derivative of something that is moving fast you are increasing or magnifying it so that the system uh, receives it in higher uh, volt in higher gain and then it rep it quickly tries to compensate for them back in the system and then at super relatively super high frequency there is nothing we can do much I mean except that we can just to keep the circuit stable we can just report back uh, I mean the loop can report back just mainly a proportional component um, so that at least the circuit remains stable so that is the whole plan for the PID. Let's just chase the uh, what op amp 1 and 2 are doing here in terms of the transfer function of the response here. So op amp 1 for both op amps let's make the assumption that the supply voltages are properly connected so plus minus 10 or plus minus 20 volt are there. Also for both op amps it's obvious that they are in negative feedback you can see output is connected to inverting or negative input that is applied for both so 
Uh, therefore, both op amps are in linear region of operation. I can make the assumption that op amps in <coughs> linear region, so not saturated, and as a result, virtual short is valid. So as a result, virtual short is valid. And that means that the voltage at positive input terminal is equal to the voltage at negative input terminal for both op amps. That's equation one. OK. Um, so I am going to then uh, refer to this V plus node as Vx. Naturally, because of uh, virtual short, uh, V negative is also at Vx, which means this node is Vx. OK, so that is, that is what I needed. Uh, then uh, for Vref, I can see that there is simple voltage division between Rb and Ra. Reason for that is Rb and Ra are effectively in series because no current can flow to input of ideal op amp because inf effectively it has infinite impedance. So I can say, therefore, Vx, uh, let me just write it here. So Vx is simply Rb over Ra plus Rb times Vref. So that is my equation number two. And uh, of course, this is V negative as well. So I have written Vx there. Now, the interesting thing is uh, there is a current that is going this way from VRPM toward Vx. And we can compute that current. Simply, it's just the voltage difference over Ra, which is VRPM minus Vx, and divide by Ra. That current is the same current that goes this way, because no current can go this way. As I said, the uh, input impedance of ideal op amp is infinite. So we can compute as a result the voltage drop across Rb and hence we can get to V1. And we can compute V1 which means then we have the answer for the voltage at the output of the op amp 1. So let's do that. I can write, uh, basically I'm doing KVL, so using Kirchhoff voltage law and combination of KVL with KCL. KCL effectively saying here at this node whatever current coming in should be equal to the current going out. So as a result I am using combination of KVL and KCL. Kirchhoff voltage and current laws or basically circuit laws. Okay so V1 is equal to at the output of op amp 1 is equal to Vx this node minus the voltage drop across Rb which is minus Rb times the current going through Rb which is uh, VRPM minus VX and then divide by and then divide by RA. Okay, so uh, if we just uh, shuffle things around we get to this answer. Uh, we get to uh, RA plus um, RB divide by RA times VX minus Rb over Ra times Vrpm. Okay, uh, now I can use equation 2 here and substitute for Vx. So using equation 2 and uh, substituting for Vx, I'm going to get Ra plus Rb divided by Ra times Rb over Ra plus Rb times Vref and then minus V R minus R B over R A V R P M. Okay, so this cancel out and then you can see that uh, you can see that this portion is common. So I can factor it out. Um, and as a result what I get is I'm gonna get I'm gonna write it here V one at the output of the op amp one is Rb over Ra times Vref minus Vrpm exactly as we expected because this is nothing but the error term so let's just say E of t error term so exactly as we this expected the voltage at the output of the op amp one is a magnified or ampli uh, let's say a magnified version of the error term 
that's exactly what we wanted and this goes at the input of the PID so now let's focus on the PID for a practical design of PID RI is usually selected to be much less than uh, R2 and it's only for mainly for the stability of the circuit I'm gonna explain why and the same thing here RD maybe I write it on top RD is selected to be much smaller than R1 so RD versus R1 and of course a reason for that is when the circuit is at very high frequency caps are effectively short so as if they are not there just wire and then we want uh, ex we want RI and RD to be there so that the circuit remains stable in terms of proper feedback because if you don't have them then it's just shorting these nodes uh, because caps at super high frequency are just short so hence the existence of RI and RD are justified at the same time when that is the case then since RI and RD are mu uh, much smaller than R1 and R2 in super high frequency uh, RI is dominant in parallel with R2 and RD is dominant in parallel with R1 and therefore the gain of the circuit converges to negative RI over RD and uh, that's exactly what we let me just change the color so that it's observable uh, that's exactly what we saw here so this gain is effectively proportional to uh, absolute value wise of course the actual value so let, let me put it this way absolute value of negative RI over RD at super high frequency at super low frequency caps are effectively open so because uh, because impedance of cap is just 1 over CS so when or 1 over JC Omega let's say if you're talking about sinusoidal steady state if Omega goes very high impedance of cap goes near zero and that's why I'm saying at super high frequency caps are short but if at super low frequency at near DC Omega goes to near zero then the denominator goes to near zero and the impedance of cap goes to infinity and hence caps are effectively open when at near these uh, zero uh, caps are open then as if these branches don't exist and therefore the circuit simply becomes uh, the effectively dominate dominated by R2 and R1 and this inverting amplifier uh, amplifier 2 will be R2 the gain of it will define will be defined by R2 and R1 and hence the gain here is negative R2 or proportional to in terms of uh, 20 log it will be 20 log 10 of um, R2 over R1 so you can see how things are playing out uh, by proper selection of RI and RD we can select uh, or define this uh, port response at the high frequency range and by proper selection of R2 and R1 we can control uh, the response here so that's the game we're playing and uh, the portion that is defined by integrator is this portion and the portion that is defined by derivative is this portion so uh, that's that's the important so the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, just find the response of part two so the sp second segment and uh, I can say in that regard I can just write it that um, let me just make sure the second op amp so the op amp 2 let's say just say op amp 2 op amp 2 is just an inverting amplifier here and by inverting amplifier we just know the gain of that is uh, straightforward so I'm gonna just write the gain of inverting amplifier so V2 uh, in S domain let's say if you are doing S domain so V2 as a function of S is equal to of let's say V2 over uh, the error term or let's say V1S just the transfer function of the second portion of the circuit is of course minus it's an inverting amplifier uh, the whole feedback impedance so it would be RI plus uh, we have impedance of cap which is 1 over 8 CS and the reason you see that the cap is HC versus C is because this integrator cap is selected to be larger so that its impact is showing up uh, at the lower frequency and defining uh, the response here versus the other cap that is a smaller one and will define the behavior here so 
uh, that's the reason but the ratio is not golden ratio I mean it can be C and 4C and C and 5C C and 8C C and 10C so it depends on application I'm just using 8C here as a good example so RI plus 1 over 8CS in parallel with R2 so that is what we have in feedback route and then we have RD plus so this RD plus 1 over CS in parallel with R1 okay so I'm just gonna write one step further because that's just good enough to explain the analysis obviously it becomes minus so R2 times RI plus 1 over 8CS divide by R2 plus RI plus 1 over 8CS 1 over 8CS and let's not forget the assumptions we have in the circuit on top so on top we know that RD is much uh, smaller than R1 and RI is much smaller than R2 so uh, if somebody wants to simpl further simplify these things those assumptions uh, can be used and then in denominator I can say R1 times RD plus 1 over CS divide by of course R1 plus <coughs> RD plus 1 over CS okay so uh, further simplifying this of course is always possible so if somebody if you want to just uh, do one last simplification even though it's not necessarily needed because we can just do the circuit analysis by thinking about s going to infinity and s going to zero but then it become it becomes r2 times ri uh, let's say 8 ri cs and uh, we have uh, plus one so plus one and uh, from denominator we have uh, r1 plus rd times cs plus one okay and then we have r1 rd cs plus 1 finally 8 R2 plus RI CS plus 1 so effectively we can see we have sort of a bi quad because we have um, a, den a numerator denominator in this transfer function for second stage that both numerator denominator are second order polynomials hence a bi quad so we can by proper selection of components we can uh, set the proper response and realize something like this uh, body plot magnitude response and then a, a proper selection of component can give us the right gain that we want for low frequency and high frequency and also the proper value for f1 and f2 depending on the application and example that we are dealing with and depending on the servo motor type that we are dealing with I hope that this example is helpful in terms of illustrating how a PID controller is designed and how is it uh, working in terms of the overall feedback loop and uh, uh, the similarity of it uh, with respect to comparing, comparing it to phase lock loop effectively we are trying to lock uh, to a specific uh, let's say uh, reference voltage and reference speed and minimize the error in the circuit uh, using the a proportional integral and derivative controller. I hope this example is helpful. Thanks for watching.